Uh, hi, good afternoon everyone. This is Rajiv S. Khanna for the losses of Rajiv S. Khanna, PCImmigration.com. Today is August 16th, 2012, and this is a community conference call. By participating in this call, you don't become our clients and we do not become your lawyers. This is an information exchange session. No obligations on either side. Please note that your voice will be recorded, so if you ask any questions, you may want to conceal your identity by making up a name or by concealing specific facts of your case. That said, let me get started on the questions that have been posted. First question is from Tamara Finkin, or yeah, Finkin, one. It says, my mother made an application for my sister and myself along with our children, one child each, and we've been waiting. See, there's a lot of a lot of issues here that are not clear. I hope you're on the phone and maybe we can talk. A uh, lot of things that, that are not clear to me are which country are you from? Which category, did, did, you know, it, it, that would determine the category, um, you know, uh, of and, and the waiting time. And I have at the end of this thread, if you look at the end of this thread, I posted a link for you. So if you look at the visa bulletin, which is what that link is to, here, here is the link. Uh, right here so if you go down to the thread read the visa bulletin it tells you the availability of visa numbers for the country that you were born in okay so I really don't have enough information to give you good answers next question is from Krishna which is his company wants to file an EB3 instead of an EB2 case based upon equity analysis this is the lawyer's advice Equ equity analysis I have never heard that expression sir um, either my education is um, deficient or your lawyers are using terms that are not known in immigration law okay so the quote that you showed me and I have also posted a message at the end of this string this quote makes no sense to me I don't see what the relevance of filing an EB2 with so-called equity analysis is. I've never heard of this term. So my advice to you is get a second opinion, get your lawyers on the phone. Uh, either they know something I don't know or they don't know what they're doing. It's one of the two. Okay. Uh, so obviously we have to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Maybe there is something in the company policies that your lawyers are better familiar with and have not been able to explain properly to you. Okay. Next question is, I just finished Krishna's question. Next question is, V-I-G-D-M-A-B, WIG DMAB. I am H-1B holder since 2008. Currently in India, got the stamping in the passport. I want to resign my job and travel to US on a dependent visa, H4. My husband is also an H1B holder. Four questions. Number one, in case my employer files for a cancellation, does it mean I don't have an H1B at all? Yes, that's what it means. Two, in case of one, does it mean I, if I try to find a job, new employer needs to apply for a new H1B against a cap? No, no. <clears throat> you will be cap exempt if a new employer wants to find a job and you know they want to convert you back to H1B you are not subject to the cap you become subject to the cap only if you've been physically outside USA for one year mere revocation of the H1 by the earlier employer does not take away your exemption to the quota and I'm, of course I'm assuming that your uh, employer that you are currently employed with is a quota employer if they are a quota exempt employer the answers would be different so if they are a normal quota employer, the fact that they have canceled your H-1 does not take away your exemption from the quota. So you're fine. Three, when I'm on H-4, will the, will the time be counted against my H-1B? No. H-4 is no longer counted towards H-1. Four, is it advisable to travel on my H-1B Initiate the H-4 process immediately once I'm in the U.S. and then resign? Um, that's a tough one. That's a really tough one. 
you see, here's my problem. If you enter USA on H-1 visa and you have no intention to continue working on H-1B, could it not be said that that entry is uh, inappropriate? If you want to come back and work for a few weeks and then convert to H-4, I think you're fine. Okay. Next question, Khyati K wants to know, um, my, does my husband qualify for EB-1? I've looked at his qualifications. I don't see how that qualifies him for EB-1. He has an MCA, um, 11 years of work experience, senior project manager. I don't see anything here that tells me that it's an EB-1 case. Okay, if you're thinking international manager or executive, then uh, let's see. I guess, hang on one second. I think you are asking me about, started as a technical position, managerial position for the last six years, does not have an MBA degree. MBA is not required for international managers. And really what we have to look at is, does he have one year of experience with his company Infosys outside USA as an executive or managerial level employee? If he does, then he can qualify under international manager category. Okay. Next question, Manikant Reddy. This is a fairly long question. F1 to H1B approval notice email has I-94 attached, but change of status has been denied. Haven't received the I-797 yet. There's a whole complicated history about starting with NJIT, then moving over to Northern Virginia. So the questions are 11, and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, I prefer that people keep their questions and their fact patterns short. That gives us more time to deal with everybody's issues. But it's okay. I'll do the best I can for you. One, since my change of status was not approved, would I be out of status at any point of time even when my current F1 status and I-94 are still valid and in status? Look, assuming that you are still maintaining student status, the fact that an H1 visa was declined should have no effect on existing status. So existing status does not get disturbed by denial of an H1. Two, what are my options should I leave right away? Okay, uh, if you are still in school and you are doing what you're supposed to be doing under your uh, curriculum, I don't see why you need to leave. But you should discuss this with your lawyers. I am not clear about your status currently. If you are maintaining status, sure, you can continue to stay here and apply for H1 um, in the next quota or you know whenever you need to. Can I continue my education and continue my doctoral program on my current status? See, that's a little complicated here. I There are a lot of things here that I'm not sure about because CPT, Northern Virginia CPT, they didn't like that. That could be a problem. There are a bunch of issues here that I can't really uh, categorically comment upon without looking at a whole bunch of different things in your background. I think you should talk with your lawyers, uh, figure out some of these issues. The UNVA, the fact that you have a denial of change of status puts me on alert that USCIS considers you to be out of status. Why? Until we get the notice, we wouldn't know. So if you're out of status, then your best bet is, of course, to leave USA, uh, assuming that you're not subject to any kind of unlawful presence problems. You should leave USA and come back on H-1 visa or whatever you can get. But I have a video on H-1 visa issues. Is it a video? I think it's a video or, or it's, it's in my blog. And H-1 visas are not easy to get. So go take a look at that also. Okay. Uh, three, can I continue my education? It all depends whether you are in status or out of status. I think you should wait until you get that um, I-797 in hand, then you will know better. Does it mean that my master's degree from UN UNVA did not hold any good? When I started my master's, UNVA was accredited. Uh, wouldn't that implicate my degree was genuine? Well, does it imply that your degree was genuine? I don't know the answer to that question. All I know is that you do not have a final degree which is accredited. So that puts you in a position where your degree is not recognized by the government. Okay. Uh, 
does doctoral program hold any immigration value? <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that question. Is the doctoral program accredited? If it is not accredited, then of course it has no value under immigration law. Can I apply for EB1 category green card? By the way, uh, EB1 category green card depends upon a whole bunch of things, not just a degree. Okay. Uh, on our website, we have a fairly good write-up on what EB1s are. Take a look at that. Six, if I pursue another master's degree program from an accredited college, university, would I be eligible for OPT program then? Um, I believe you get OPT only once for one program, but you can double check with the DSO. I don't remember the exact details. Can I apply for H1B under specialty occupation with the new degree? Sure. Absolutely. At any point in the near future, while I'm still on F1 visa and continue my education, if I leave to my home country, will this H1B COS decline have any impact on my I-94? Will I lose my I-94 status? Will I be able to re-enter USM on F1 visa and status? Well, see, my problem is, I suspect USCIS does not consider you to be in status. That's my suspicion. If that is the case, whether you are inside or outside, you have the same problem. You're out of status. Can I cancel my H-1B approval and choose to stay in current F-1 visa status? If you have not been given a change of status, um, you are not on H-1. So there's nothing to cancel. Ninth question, a past-time master's degree, you mean a part-time master's degree. Well, if the degree is accredited, it doesn't matter whether you did it full-time or part-time. Uh, the only problem is you cannot get F1 for part-time uh, studies. In my I-797C, it is mentioned that the consulate is Hyderabad. Can I go to Canada? Yes, you can. Can I go to some other consulate? Yes, you can. In India, you can go to any consulate and you can also try a third country. Remember, though, that in the third country, the consulate, if they find that you are out of status, they can decline to entertain your application. They don't do that normally in Canada, but definitely the right exists. If I visit consulate for H-1B stamp, and if my visa is not approved, can I come back with F-1 visa? As long as you're maintaining status, and you will continue to maintain status of F-1 upon return, I don't see why not. Raja K. I think a lot depends upon um, your I-797. Let's see what that says first. Raja K. L-1B extension and H-1B processing at the same time. I'm working on L-1B with employer A. And I've applied for H-1B through employer B with change of status. It is an initial review. I want to go to India for two weeks. My current employer is going to apply for L1B extension as soon as I come back. What if H1B with change of status is approved prior to L1B extension is approved? Well, if you are, instead of going through all these scenarios, let me just give you the simple decision tree. If you leave USA, as you know, your H-1B COS is deemed to be abandoned. Okay, Then when you come back, L-1B extension does not get bothered by your H-1B approval. Okay, If H-1B... Let me rephrase that. If by mistake they approve the H-1B um, with change of status, your only option is to go outside USA again and come back on L1B visa or apply for a change of status back to L1B. So if USCIS does not make a mistake and they approve the H1B without COS, there is no effect on your L1B extension. If by mistake they approve the H1B uh, after the L1B extension is approved, you will have to go out and come back or apply for change of status again. Okay. I think I covered all your uh, scenarios, Raj. 
planning to visit India for two weeks. H1B, what if H1B with COS approved prior to L1B extension? I just answered that. H1B is approved after L1B extension. I answered that. How likely is it that my L1B extension will get approved if my H1B with COS is approved prior to? Um, I don't think um, that's going to be an issue. If change of status to H1B is approved, by, by mistake, you can immediately send a letter saying that this COS was approved by in error and CC that letter to the L1B petition as well. Okay, so but the worst case scenario is you'll have to go outside and get come back and if you already have an L1B visa stamp, you can just re-enter with that and a new approval, you're back on L1B. Okay, uh, what if my H1B gets approved during the past to the weeks that I'm in India? Will I be in denied port entry at the port of uh, uh, port of entry since I'll be coming back on my L1B? No, no. By coming back on L1B, you are going back on L1B. So if the H1B gets approved while you're outside, and you come back using your L1B, you're back on L1B. Any idea if my COS gets abandoned as soon as I get go out of USA or after returning back? Well, your change of status gets abandoned the moment you step outside USA. Will this travel relieve any constrained constraints contributed by COS on my L2 extension process or add more constraints? No, I don't think the travel really has anything to do with the constraints. I will leave my dependents uh, who have also applied for COS. Will this be fine? Yeah, I don't see any problem with that. Dependents take your status, whatever that is. Okay. Next question, student visa for US. Just wanted to know if a person holding a valid student visa of five years can go back on the same visa after a gap of semester due to a medical reason. You need to talk with the DSO. If the DSO approves, Mr. Ahmad, your medical leave, I think you should have no problem using the same visa. You need to talk to your D DSO about this. Super Fantastic has a DV question. I'm sorry, I have absolutely no knowledge of DVs. We don't take these cases because in most of them a lawyer is not needed. EB2 for October, I have no idea sir um, what the date of the movement of the dates is going to be. Everybody reads the same visa bulletin. You're going to have to rely upon the Department of Labor's predictions. B1 visitor visa question. In-laws came on a B1 visitor visa. 10-year visa. Mother-in-law is planning to extend it for six more months. I have some material on my blog about visa extensions and how they are usually a bad idea. Because if she extends it and she's here for almost a year, then if she wants to come back again before at least one more year outside USA, she will have a problem. They don't like the idea that somebody is living in USA for one year and then going home for three, four months and then coming back again. Okay, um, what are the reasons that should be mentioned to USCIS? You can't make up reasons, whatever the truth is. If she wants to stay here because she's visiting family, she may not be able to come back again, all those things, you know, whatever the truth, truthful reasons are, these are papers that are filed, filed under penalty of perjury. You want to tell the truth here. Okay, uh, only thing I would caution you is if there are babies in the house, be careful about how you mention to the government that uh, she also wants to take care of the children because I've seen cases where USCIS starts thinking oh this is basically um, a job then okay it's kind of funny because even in USA grandmas take care of the kids there's no big deal it's not like a job it's just out of love and affection but sometimes they start thinking of it as a job and that can be a problem so be careful and be mention that very cl clearly that she will be if she is involved in any child care, she'll be taking care of her grandchildren just like any other grandchildren, a grandmother would. Okay. And note that this is not a job. This is merely family helping family while they are here. Or or you know, I like to say everything just the way it is. I mean, no no games. How many days before her I-94 expires should we apply for her B1 visa? Well, if you look at the regulations, I remember there is a regulation somewhere that says 
you have to apply or you should apply no earlier than 60 days before the I-94 expires uh, and no earlier, no, no later than, let me rephrase that. There's a, there's a window they say, no earlier than 60 days before the I-94 expires and no later than 30 days before it expires. As a practical matter, I have seen them entertain applications filed even on the last day. So there is something in the regs that talks about that, but I have seen them entertain applications filed at any time, as long as it's before the I-94 expiration. Father-in-law is planning to go back for two, three weeks, and then he wants to come back again. They can definitely stop him from coming back. So be careful with this, uh, Uday. <clears throat> then you have a question, meeting with my attorney. I did post a question last week. My lawyer is contradicting. I don't know uh, what that question is. Uday. You can ask me if you're on the phone. Um, but if you want us to talk to your lawyer, certainly we'll be happy to do that. Um, it's a good idea to compare notes with our colleagues. No problem. What we charge depends upon how much time is involved. You can send me an email if you want to, uh, through the contact us form, um, and uh, you know we can we can talk about it. Whatever needs to be done. Jyoti Basu, Palm I-140 issue. Worked for Company A for two years. They filed labor. Still pending. Now I've got another company, and I've taken that job. Number one, since I'm in no more working with company A, can they still file my I-140? Yes. As long as the employer that you have left still has the intention to hire you sometime in the future, and you have the intention to join them, they can file the I-140. Um, they don't want to revoke the, I want, uh, the labor or stop the green card process. They said if they filed based upon future employment, their chances of getting audited. That's not true. Audit is the wrong term. Audit gets used with the Department of Labor. That's already filed. Okay. But definitely it becomes more complicated to demonstrate the ability to pay wages. Does the employer have enough money to be able to pay you when you're not even working with them? That's the only issue I see. Otherwise, I don't see any other problem. And I, I don't think their reasoning is correct. I think they should talk with their lawyers. Any other suggestions which make my process of applying I-140 easy? No, nothing more than that. Next question is, PBU Gudai underscore sis. Working in an IT company. Came to US on L1B from another IT company. You had experience from three companies, then one of the companies went out of business. So the question is in my resume, should I show that? Yes, you should. You should, even if the company is out of business. Absolutely. See, visa is not based upon your resume, but I think you should use your correct resume always. The companies out of business is no problem. Eligibility for EB2 category from Kamlesh 21. You have a bachelor's in industrial production engineering. I'm assuming that's a four-year degree after 12th standard. If so, you should be able to apply for EB2 because you have seven years of experience. Looks like you should be able to do an EB2. Anand GS. My GC got approved five months ago, but my H1B amendment got denied. Who cares? You've got your green card. No problem at all, Anand. Congratulations. Shikha dot lovely. Okay. I-94 was the same date as my L1B. But then when she went to India, they have given her I-94 more than her petition, which is not what they should do. That's wrong. 
is there any way I can get a new I-94? Shikha, I'm assuming that you want to apply for an L-1B extension. You can apply for it within six months based upon your I-797, your L-1B approval. You can ignore the erroneous, erroneous I-94 and in the paperwork point out to the government that the, L, that, the, that the L1B was only good till point X and that the point Y on the I-94 is an error. Okay, so that should take care of it. Let me just double check I've got the facts right. Okay, officer has given me I-94 Feb 2014. Yeah, yeah exactly, they made a mistake. AG-22 I-140 priority date porting due to change in employers. Well, first of all, let me clarify something for you. For everybody, actually. There are two kinds of porting of green card. One is just the priority date porting, and the other one is porting of the whole green card. Porting of the whole green card is done under AC-21. Okay? What that means is that I have a green card going. 485 has been pending 180 days. I-140 is approved. And I'm going to take another job somewhere else. I'll port my green card over. There, the jobs have to be similar. The other one is the I-140 priority date porting. If you're just porting the priority date, the jobs do not have to be similar. They can be completely different. So I'm looking at the rest of it. Yes, you should be allowed to keep your priority date because your I-140 is approved. How much does it cost to revoke the I-140? Nothing, just a letter. Is it true that sometimes USCIS issues new I-140 with new priority date? Yes. See, what happens is USCIS, even if they give you the new priority date on the I-140, they should still automatically give you the old priority date when the time comes. Why? Because they run system sweeps uh, several times a month. And they say that, that we automatically take care of these things. So even if your, your I-140 has been issued with the new priority date, um, when the old priority date becomes current, they should automatically um, start working on your I-485. Okay? Uh, Kumaran K, switching from AP to H4, wife entered with her AP in March, AP expired in April, we did not apply, apply for a renewal, she wants to travel again, okay, if she does switch to H4, would that create any problem with her I-485, no, not at all. She can, if she wants, be outside USA and get her H-4 visa stamp to come back. Although I'll tell you something. I prefer that she get her AP approved before she goes. What if the H-4 is denied? She would have no way of coming back into USA. Okay. Next question, cool KK. Visa is ex ex ending in August. Employer A is applying for extension. B is going to apply for transfer at the same time. Is this a problem? No, no. The law regarding quota does not allow a quota employee to file multiple cases through the same employer. Same employer. Different employers, no problem. A, baby, will when parents get immigrant visa, will the dependent children be granted the same immediately? No. No. When your son, who is a U.S. citizen, applies for you, only you, not your wife, not your children, get the green card automatically. They have to be applied for separately. And the times are in the visa bulletin. Mutu 10 has a domestic battery case. I cannot answer questions about how to fill the form. That's a problem. Okay, I can't really do that. Uh, but N-400 
requires that you must demonstrate good moral character. And if you have a conviction of uh, a domestic battery, even though you call it deferred edu adjudication and all that, a deferred prosecution, there is a whole lot of things that we have to look at to decide whether or not this is a conviction. So the very brief answer to your question, can this be a problem for my N400? Probably yes. Is it an insurmountable problem? It depends upon the officer who's reviewing your case. So when it comes to deciding upon whether or not you have good moral character for citizenship purposes, um, let me rephrase that. My mouth is getting a little lazy. Citizenship purposes, for citizenship purposes, they can look at many different factors, not just a conviction. Even the fact that it happened can be a problem for, uh, for um, good moral character. Should I apply now and get it over with? Yeah, I think you should. Should I get a lawyer or not? Why? Well, that's up to you. I certainly think you're going to need a lawyer somewhere along the line. I prefer that you get a lawyer. And you should get a lawyer locally where you are if you want them to go with you. Because if you hire somebody out of town like us, we will not go with you to the N400 interview. A lot of people don't care about that, but some people do want their lawyer to go with them. Such people should hire local lawyers. And of course, if you want a second opinion, you want to retain us for something, you can always do that. We can work with your lawyer. Next question, Koga underscore 1984. H-1B transfer with I-797B. I'm a student. I-20 is valid till August 2013. H-1B was approved in March 2011 quota this year. So now he figures out he did not get change of status, I guess. So from March, you started working, I take it, and you didn't realize that you were working without authorization. You know, I think you need to get in touch with your lawyers. This is, again, there is an issue of unlawful presence. It doesn't look like it applies to you because you have an F1 status, which is valid till August 2013. Uh, but somebody needs to look at the law. I don't remember exactly what the, how the law applies when it's a change of status case. Does the old I-94 still protect you from unlawful presence? I don't mean to worry you, but I just want you to have your lawyers take a look at it. They need to look at every aspect of your case to make sure uh, if you're trying to go to Canada or India to get visa stamping, you're not going to be subject to the three or 10 year bar. Okay, so should a new company file for a change of status along with the transfer petition? Oh, I think you could apply for a transfer now um, and leave USA and then when the transfer is approved, it can be sent to you and you can come in with the new H1 visa stamp. That might be a good way to do it. Mini117 says, U.S. citizen husband walked out of a marriage after nine months. No problem. You see, the law requires only that the marriage when entered into was entered into in good faith. In other words, your daughter was not trying to get fancy with U.S. immigration laws. So the fact that she brought in all her money and put it into a joint account all of that seems to suggest that this was a genuine marriage. I suggest you read the instructions on form I-751, I-751. It's a good idea to read through that form. He cannot withdraw his sponsorship. I don't think that's going to be a problem. You should look at the form I-751 instruction, I instructions and maybe even have a consultation with a local lawyer and see if they suggest anything concrete. H-1B, one year leave of absence. Sue wants to know, I am on an H-1B, taking a leave of absence for one year. Can my employer apply for H-1B extension while I'm, out, out, I'm outside? USA, I guess. The answer is yes. Will being on leave of absence without pay be a problem? I don't see that as a problem at all. You have an EAD-AP uh, so that 
will not help me return in September 13. One problem, Sue, if you are outside USA without a valid advanced parole and an H-1 visa, you could have an abandonment issue of your, of your 485. So be mindful of that. That could be a problem. If my green card gets approved in the meantime, can I enter on H-1B? No. Once the green card is approved, you can have the green card mailed to you. I've seen that happen with people. I don't know how legal or illegal that is. But certainly people in your situation have done that. If you want to be even more clear about this, call CBP, Customs and Border Protection. See what they suggest. They're usually pretty receptive to phone calls. Last question is my test. How can I know if my visa is canceled? You have your visa already. It will expire in October 2012. You haven't come to USA. What kind of visa is it? I need to know more about that. So tell me what kind of visa it is. All right, folks. I'm done with my questions. As I had anticipated, it took about six minutes more than I had anticipated. So people who have follow-up questions on what I have just discussed, follow-up questions only, please press five star on your phone five star five star on your phone okay I only have one follow-up question area code 412 just one second okay can you hear me just one second Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, go ahead. What is your question? Uh, so this is, this is not a follow-up question. Uh, I actually had a question uh, for myself. Um, well, hang on one second. Uh, obviously, nobody has a follow-up question, so I can start taking new questions then. Go ahead. Whatever your question is, go ahead, please. Yeah, I actually was in a uh, call for the Sure. I asked a couple of questions there, but I had most more questions. Sure, sure. So you are a student of Harguan University, and you are interested in some questions about that. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, my wife attended Harguan, and she graduated from the university, and I and we applied for her OBD extension. She is done with. She will be done with her one year OBD in on October first. Okay. We applied for her OBD extension. Okay. So my questions that if the OBD extension is rejected before October first. Uh, she can apply for change of status to H4, right? Uh, worst case scenario, she can go outside USA, get an H4 visa stamp and come back. So, See, status... Yeah, there's, there's some question in that. Yeah, status becomes yeah, tricky. Wait, wait. Status becomes tricky because we don't know at what point, what point of time USCIS will consider her to be out of status. Is it from the very beginning of the OPT or her student career, it's impossible for me to say at this point of time. Because remember, we also don't have any definitive word on what they're doing with the school. Like I said in the conference that we had, we don't know what they're doing with the school. Okay, So status becomes very difficult for me to define at this point of time, until I know more about what they're doing with the university. They can still they can still go back on it. They can still go back on it. Okay, so you mean even if our OPD is rejected before or after October first, and we apply for a change of status to H four, even if it is approved, we she still will be out of status. What I'm saying is they may not give her H four within USA. Okay, so she has to go for go out and then. Uh, I don't know if she has to. I don't know if she has to, but there is potential that she might have to. No, not until not until we have not until we have a definitive decision from the government on the university's uh, status. We don't know what they are going to do. Okay, so that's not possible. 
I prefer change the status to H4. And if it is uploaded to issue, you'll get a ISO 97 with i9 for that can stay in US without going out. Yes, if our H4 is approved within USA, definitely, then there is no problem. Uh, that is, well, that is correct, that she could end up with an H4 without an I-94, which is worthless, or she could get up, get an H4 with an I-94, which is perfect, then there's no problem. So then, in the second case, she doesn't need to leave the US and just stay here, and whenever she goes out of country, she needs to get a visa. If she gets an I-94, then she doesn't need to leave USA, and she can go for a visa stamping whenever she feel like, feels like going. If USCIS considers her to be out of status already. So that, that depends on what they uh, do with the immigrant status, right? Exactly. Status. What they do with the school and then what do they do with the students? Two things we have to look at. Okay. But okay. In her case, she's, uh, within, she's not out of status or anything, right? Because she was an F1 and she was an OP. Sir, that is something you and I are talking it's about. That's something you and I are talking about. I don't know what you, what what USCIS is going to say. Okay. So we have to wait. So, but ideally, if everything goes fine, uh, she has to. Uh, okay. Let right. me make it. Let me make it. Let me let me let me make it really simple for you. There is no way for me to predict at this time. Okay. Only thing that is predictable is if she wants to go for an H four visa stamping now. She has the right to do so. Will she get an H-4 visa stamping? I don't know. Even for people who have no problem, H-4 visa stamping is uncertain. Uh, as long as you are maintaining status, your case is straightforward, she should get an H-4 visa stamping. Yeah, and, and other, uh, this to the daily, she's, she's pregnant and she, she, she might be unable to travel out of US uh, or out of October or November. Well, then we have no choice. Then you sit and wait. Let's see what happens. Sit and wait and see what happens. Yep. 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 Okay. Okay. If you hear something there about... That... Hang on. If you hear something about Harguan, uh, their charter getting affected or their, uh, you know, um, accreditation getting affected, you give me a call. Okay, sure. Until we know that... Also the worst case. Yeah. Worst case scenario, we send her out. See, the, the good news is, even if something bad happens, she'll probably still have a good 180 days in during which nothing permanent, da no, no permanent damage occurs. So it's not like she's going to have to travel outside right away. That's my guess. Okay. Okay. Let me take the other calls at this time. Yeah, not the H for rejection. No, this is a little bit more complicated than that. But nothing is going to happen overnight, don't worry. Something happens with the school status, you give me a call. Okay? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Good luck to you, sir. And, and one last question, sir. Uh, so, if you apply for Canada visa, she can go there and get the stamp done and then come back here, right? Theoretically, yes. Practically, I don't know. It all depends upon whether Canada wants to give her a visa or not. Yeah, but ideally, that's the best option. The best option to travel. Uh, that's that's a good option. Yeah. I do not know what the what best option is because I don't know what future holds for the university. We keep going round and round in the same thing. Okay? I don't know. The answer is I do not know at this time. Okay. Good luck to you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, we have Okay, one, two, three questions. Uh, let's start with the person who logged in the the earliest. Area code 646, go ahead, please. Sure. Uh, my name is Krishna. I have a question regarding my parents sending them for a visitor visa interview. Okay. My, my father is in service and he's retired this December. Okay. And uh, the USA, when they went for interview previously, they have rejected without any reason. And I'm presently working for an employer X. Right now, I have accepted a new employment with employer Y, and my visa transfer is under process, and I've got the receipt number. It's under regular process. 
One second. So, One second. Are you yourself on H1 visa? Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I, try, I'm, I got the receipt number with the new employer, but got it. still uh, didn't get the new I-797. Okay. So I'm planning to send them for an interview in September again. So is it safe for me to send them? Well, you know, a couple of, couple of issues here. First of all, your status as being in between a transfer has little bearing. I'm not that concerned about that. What I am concerned about is the fact that they've been declined a tourist visa earlier. That does not look good for any future grant. Once they have declined the tourist visa, and I'm assuming it's on the ground that they could become immigrants in USA. The, yes, and I also the financials I only showed is about only eight thousand dollars as per the bank statement. Well, that usually is not sufficient problem by itself. But in any case, the earlier denial, unless it is for grounds unrelated to immigrant intention, they become a problem for future tourist visa. So yes, I'm not sir. that that worried about the transfer status that you're in. I am more concerned about the denial. Okay, because they didn't ask any questions or any documents or any certificates for my father because he works for a government uh, organization and he's retired in December. He, they never asked anything. They just saw my H-1 papers and then uh, they just uh, said, uh, sorry. Well, it looks like they might have a shot if that's indeed the problem. So I wouldn't worry so much about the transfer. If you are worried, and I, I'm not sure how much I am concerned about that part, you can always premium the case and just get your H1 approval, I guess. Okay, but it is, it is safe that I can send them and uh, they can explain there, saying that uh, he'll be retiring in December and he needs to come back on my, and he, um, and my daughter's uh, birthday is coming on October 30th, so they'll be visiting U.S. for my daughter's birthday. So, you know, it's not possible for me to say what is safe, what is not safe. Your question regarding safety relates to your in-between status of the transfer. I feel that the fact that he's retiring is much more of a problem. Okay? Not so much the H1 status. So the bottom line, my, uh, in my opinion, Krishna, is this. The only way you are going to find out is have them apply. We don't know what's going to happen. Okay? Okay. Good luck to you. Sure. Thank Bye-bye. You. Okay. Um, I have, let's see, five more questions. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Area code 940. Oops. It went up again. Just one second. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, Raj. Yes, this is uh, Right. So, uh, you talked about something I-797 form. Uh, like, I'm not sure what is that because I don't have that. You see, what I'm assuming is, you said initially my I-94 was the same as my L-1B expiry date. Yes. Okay. And I'm assuming, uh, again, I'm not sure of all the facts, but I was assuming that when you were coming back, by mistake, they gave you I-94 beyond your L-1B approval, correct? Yes. Yes, so that's what I had assumed. And that is illegal. They shouldn't have done that. Yes. So, uh, so what you do is, yes, what you do is, Shika, listen to me. What you do is, yes. you ignore the error. And you go with the approval notice date, which is what I-797 is. It's your L-1B approval okay. notice. Where can I get I-797? Your employer should have it. And uh, what will be the date on that? Do you have any idea? I wouldn't know. Whatever the date of the original I-94 was. See, there are things about your case I don't know. Did you enter on a blanket visa, for example? Now, you said that yes without, without knowing what that means. So I want you to go back with your employer and pull out your file 
and see what the original approval notice is. I'm actually quite confused about what, what is bothering you. Are you trying to do an early extension? What is it that you're trying to accomplish here? Yeah, but hang on one second. Um, this whole situation is kind of strange. Here's what you need to do. First of all, figure out whether the I-94 that you have in hand is issued by mistake. Okay? Uh, how do I do that? Go back to your employer, compare it against the original approval notice. Okay? Right. The, and the dates of the approval notice and the dates of the I-94 should be the same. Okay. If the dates are the same, then of course you have to go in January and come back with a new visa which might be good only for a few months. Okay. Let's look at your uh, I-94 expiration date. Right now is Feb 2014. And you are planning to go in January 2013. Just get a visa for one year. What is the problem? Visa for one year means uh, go back and get a new visa from India. Maybe? There are exactly there are only two possibilities. Either the I-94 is correct or it is incorrect. If it is correct, uh, have... listen to me, Shika. You're in too much of a hurry. Listen to me. Okay. If the L1, if the I-94 is correct. Then you go to India, get visa till February 2014. With me so far? Yeah, uh, I, uh, like, I heard another option that uh, you can go back to CBC and uh, nearby CBC office and we can... Boy, you know, hang on one second. Well, hang on one second. We are actually, you are jumping way ahead of time. See, the problem with internet is people get information, but they don't know what information is good and how to apply it to their cases. That's my biggest problem with the internet. Okay? What I'm telling you is, you need to figure out, is the I-94 issued correctly with the right dates, or is it issued incorrectly? Are you with me so, so far? Yes, yes. Okay, don't, don't tell me what you know. Just listen to what I'm telling you. Don't tell me what you know. Just listen to what I'm telling you. If it is correct, that means okay. your status is good till Feb 2014, correct? Right. Then you go to India in Jan 2013 and get yourself a visa till Feb 2014, okay? Uh, get my visa till 2014 means uh, L1 visa or yeah. plastic visa, whatever my employer... L1B visa. L1B visa, Shikha, that's what you have. Why do you have to apply if your status is good till Feb 2014? Yes. A visa is always a stamp in your passport. Nothing else. A visa is a stamp in your passport. Okay? So, if your I-94 is correct, that means your status is good till 2014, you will go to India, get a visa till 2014. With me so far? Yes. All right. If it is incorrect, mm -hmm. it has been issued for more time than it should have been, then you ignore the I-94, apply for an extension as soon as you can. No. No. Okay. No. I think, ma'am, you know what? Talk to your lawyers. This is not something I can help you resolve because I don't think you are following what I'm saying. And it is impossible for me to explain to you entire structure of immigration law in five minutes. Get together with your lawyers. 
figure out what they recommend you do. End of story. I wish I could give you more information than that. I just cannot. There isn't enough time for me to be able to lead you step by step because you have some basic misunderstanding about the way this process works. Listen to this recording when you have time and replay it and replay it. What I'm telling you is very simple. Just don't ask me any more questions on this. Just replay this recording and replay it for your employer if you like. There are only two possibilities. I-94 is correct, which means it is the same date as your I-797, or it is incorrect. If it is correct, you just go in January, get your visa stamping. If it is incorrect, tell them to ignore the I-94, apply for an extension based upon the I-797. End of story. Okay? Play it again and again and again, and you'll get it eventually. Let me go on. There's six, seven other people who are waiting. Good luck to you. Area code 201, go ahead, please. Uh, hi, uh, this is Amit. Uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, you, had a, you just mentioned this was a priority date related question. So I think we covered the point. But the main point of discussion was even if my existing employer revokes my I-140 or the DC process, uh, still, and I, uh, still my, I would be able to keep my priority date even if it revokes it. Because I have read across the forums, Multiple people saying multiple things. There are people who are given very much in a clear instruction instances where they expected their priority date to be the previous priority date from the old employer, and USCIS uh, it completely denied it, saying your existing process was revoked, so you can't be issued a same priority date. So uh, can you confirm confirm that if that Amit, revoked, even go to go to my blog. I have a video on this, which was done about a month or two ago. Finally. A couple of months ago, USCIS came, uh -huh. came out and said, we will let you carry the priority date forward even if the I-140 is revoked, unless the I-140 is revoked for fraud. Okay, all right. All right. So, so, so that's, that's fine. So maybe it's a more recent one, and the blogs I, I read were probably like December or January 2012, so maybe that's the word. Uh, all right. So, uh, sir, a couple of other small questions. I mean, actually, I have to go uh, to India, or I would say, you know, maybe another country, uh, you know, for some personal reasons. Uh, if, I mean, I know it's subjective, but uh, if, if you have to choose from, you know, like of Mexico, Canada, and Australia, and possibly India, which is the best place to get stamping done? Because I'm hearing a lot of horror stories when people go there and, and not able to come back. Anything but India. Anything but India, even like in India, uh, people also said Delhi is better than others, than, but even Delhi is bad today. I don't know about Delhi. I don't know about anything. Okay. All I know is I've got people stuck in all consulates in India. All right, sir. Sir, other thing is with the stamping itself, my current, I'm an obviously H1 and, a, and a, you know, uh, the client I work for through a middle vendor. Middle vendor is giving me a very clear cut uh, letter as uh, whatever I'm telling, asking, they are giving. But the client is seeing the company policy, they're not giving me any client letter whatsoever. Uh, possibly what all they uh, I think to give me is, a, is an email from my AVP and or the VP uh, from my client, actually, and client, they, they, they can give me an email saying, to the company policies, we can't give you client letter. So how important is the client letter uh, for stamping purposes? It is as important as the consulate wants to make it. It is. Listen to me. Listen to me. It is as important as the consulate wants to make it. They want to make it very important. It is very important. They want to ignore it. It is no problem. Okay. So there is always a risk at that. Then that there is a very uh, in uh, India. Uh, okay. If you if you went to uh, Indi if you went to India, uh, I would bet money your case will be denied. If if the client letter is not there. Yes. Okay. If you don't have a client okay. letter, even with client letters, they are denying cases. Oh, is it? Uh, even, even, even. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about India. Say, for example, I go to Canada. Uh, even in Canada, without client letter, things are getting denied. I see. In Canada, I have not heard any stories of them insisting on client letters. Okay, because I'm close to. Uh, you know, I can also go to Mexico. I mean, I don't mind going to Mexico. So. I, all I can tell you is, as far as my knowledge goes, anything except India. All right, sir. So, the other thing is, uh, 
thing is, you know, after the quick expense transfer and the, 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 the premium processes versus uh, the normal process, is normal process is really taking four, five, six months uh, sometimes, and premium is obviously 15 days or 20 days. So, um, or, or actually the normal process is within within month or so. Is it? How much time the transfer or the extension is taking these days? Normal processing okay. is multiple months. Multiple months. All right. right. And uh, so the last question, no, actually the last. At this point of time, since I wish to go outside the country anyhow because of the reasons, and I'm getting a full-time option, and the full-time employer wants, uh, obviously, is going to willing to give everything, green card, everything they are willing to uh, you know, uh, work, and obviously the client letter. So uh, considering I can keep my priority date, uh, I mean, uh, it, I, I think that, you know, taking a full-time job now, uh, because I will get a client letter also and have to go outside country, seems like a better idea than existing. Uh, keeping with the existing employer, and uh, you know, only my concern was I don't want to go back to the queue in the GC processing because of the 30 days. But since you confirmed we are okay there, and uh, it, uh, so can I just go ahead and take my new job there? Oh, sir, uh, USCIS is as dependable as <laughs> you know how they are. Uh, today, this is this is this is their thinking. They are just like the weather. Today it's rain, tomorrow it's sunshine. So, as far as the law is concerned today, yes, you can go ahead and take the job. All right, I understand, but there's always some risk attached with the whole thing, shifting jobs, uh, because my priority date is December 2010, which is not far away from what we had these two months. So, so, I don't want to go back to the queue and add a complexity to my case, but uh, I understand my guess is that I could hear you also, but it becomes difficult to uh, assess. So, I understand. Thank you very much, sir. I think You're I welcome. Got my answer that I need to make a decision now. So, thank good, you very much. Good luck, Amitji. Area code 908. Oh, 908. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. All my questions. My pleasure. Uh, I have some following questions, actually. So, you said that, uh, you know, USGS is considering me as an out of status uh, as, as of now. So, no, wait, wait, wait. Who are you? Uh, Malika is ready. Uh, sixth, mm, question. sixth question. Give me one second. Sorry, Mr. Eddie, I didn't get your name, so that's why. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm on your question. So, what is what is it that you're asking me now? Uh, you said that, you know, are you, are you is considering my case to be out of status. That's why they have. No, I am only making a guess. What I told you was until we see the notice from USCIS. Anything that we are talking about is basically just making guesses. Yes, yeah, but I spoke to one other lawyer. Uh, he was mentioning that because the email has I-95 attached to it, uh, it says that you know, I'm good to you know, work on my H1, but at the same time, uh, I received the 7913, uh, and it says that you know, it's only the board, but you know, should have denied. So that's a contradicting condition, isn't it, sir? Yeah, I think what you should do is get in touch with the USCIS customer service. Have your employer do it. Let's see if they can give you better information. Sir, and in any case, if I go out of sir, I mean, how long would I have to before I leave the country and out of If, see, there is no grace period. When somebody's out of status, they have to leave right away. Okay? I have it. But there yeah, are... I, I was, I was under the impression that we get an uh, day days completed. No, 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 no. You are rendered deportable immediately. But permanent damage to your status and your ability to return to USA occurs once you have been unlawfully present in USA for 180 days. Then you can't come back for three years. Okay. 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 So that, that's the case. Okay. Yep. So, I mean, do I have a fighting chance? I do not know. I do not know what the problem is. Well, right now we don't even know what the problem is. I might even tell you, don't fight. It's a waste of your money. So it all depends upon what the problem is. I mean, I think it's a little premature for us to have this discussion. Once you get the, uh, once you, yeah, of course. Once you get that seven nine seven, feel free to let us know and uh, let me take a look at it. I'll see what needs to be done. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, sir. My my pleasure. Bye bye. You too, Mr. Eddie. Bye bye. Okay, we've got three more people in the line. Uh, area code 732, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Nishti. Uh, sir, I have just filed for my uh, citizenship uh, application. 
application that is N400 for my spouse. I have a younger brother who is my blood relative so on an F1 visa. He is graduating the summer of 2013. I intend, after I become a U.S. citizen, I intend to file for his uh, permanent residency. Could you please guide me into it? What no, I, I don't think that's a realistic option because it takes 13 years for him to get green card. Okay. And, uh, and he cannot stay in USA or work just because you filed his green card. Okay, so there is no way that I can file for his... Search. File for his green card when he gets his H1 because he's allowed to have multiple green cards pending so that he can also apply through his employment, apply through you, apply through whatever else he can whatever comes first he gets it but don't do it before he gets his h1 okay so once he gets his h1 that's when i can apply for his change of status yeah he'll be just not change of status you'll apply for his i-130 and yeah, it'll, I it'll stay pending for about 13 years um, maybe more so the thing is having it filed through you gives him additional option so not a bad idea Nishaji, you have to look at the visa bulletin on our website and figure out the timing from there. Oh, right. And remember, like I said, he can have multiple green cards going. Parents can apply, you can apply, um, his employment can apply, every, every, everything can go on at the same time. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Patel. You're welcome. Call me Rajiv, please. Good luck. Two more questions, guys. 954, go ahead, area code 954. Yeah, hello, Rajiv. Uh, this is Rahul over here. I have one quick question. My H1P employer is my brother. Now, uh, how safe it is to apply for a green card by him? Well, we have done um, four or five green cards for brothers and family owned businesses. How big is the company? Uh, it is not a big company over here, but yeah, the company registered in India is a big company. How many employees do they have in USA? In USA, we have uh, three to four employees only. Yeah, it's a it's a risky case. I I think it's a very long shot. Okay. It becomes problematic in companies that small to get a green card through family-owned uh, business. And if I take, uh, advanced any amount of time, as long as the advanced parole is valid. You see, the only question that remains is, is the job in USA really a permanent job and still available? That's the only question. How long you stay outside is irrelevant. Oh, okay. okay. So I can come back to US uh, if my green card is, if my green card is in process and I have a valid visa, right? You can, yes. All right. Good luck to you. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. And the last question of the day is area code 814. Go ahead, please. Hello, Raju. This is Shiva. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I completed my PhD in engineering in August 2011. Right. From then, I'm working in an engineering company uh, on my OPT. Okay. And right now, I'm on OPT STEM extension, valid until... December 2013. Okay. But my F1 visa is expired on 2011 August. Okay. So I'm kind of contemplating to visit India in like four to five months time down the line. And when I when I look at prospects of getting my F1 visa renewed while on OPT some extension, I get like varied opinions from different people. Yeah, I know at least two people who are stuck in India. Uh, in your situation, consulate has created so many problems for them. Um, it depends upon your history. You said you went to an accredited school, right? I, I went to what? An accredited school for your degree? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, and uh, how did you enter USA? When did you enter USA? Uh, it's 2007. Uh, it's based on F1 visa. 
You see, people who entered on F1 visa maintained student status, never did any um, anything that the government considers inappropriate. They have a better chance of getting F1 visa stamping. If I were you, I would try it from Canada first, because if they, well, no, not really. It's difficult to predict. If it's possible for you to not go, that will be perfect. But if you have to go, you're taking a chance. Yeah, I mean, my, my employer is going to apply for H-1B next year. So uh, I can, I will get it next October. But I was just uh, planning if I can go at all. Yeah, yeah, the bottom line response to your question, is it safe? The answer is no such thing as safe. But as far as people who have obvious problem areas, you don't seem to have any. Okay? Okay. So, I don't see any obvious risk, but there is always risk. Okay. Anything else? So, yeah? is it best to get it done in Canada? Or? No, see, I changed my mind because in Canada, if they deny you a visa, technically you cannot come back into USA anyway. Um, okay. People do it, but the law in the book says you shouldn't be allowed to come back to USA if there's a visa denial. AVR, which is automatic visa revalidation, doesn't work for cases like that. But as a practical matter, people do it all the time. Okay. So the best you are suggesting is if possible to stay here and get your H1B. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't look like there is a chance of rejection, but there is always a risk. Yes, sir, you have stated my opinion perfectly. Okay? Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, it looks like there's a follow-up question. I'll do this last question, then we are done. Area code 408, go ahead, please. 408? Yes, sir, there's a follow-up question. Uh, it's posted by Moore. Which is number? Which number is that? Okay. Oh yes. Okay. EB one. You see, wait a minute, for, for inter international manager category, degrees are not required. You've got to have, you've got to have at, at least one year experience outside USA, not a day less. Okay, and is that a continuous period? Of well, that's, there's a big uh, debate about that. Uh, that's a gray area of the law. Um, if there is too much gap between statuses, it has to be continuous. But if it's just a month or two months here and there, it's not a problem. Yes, it could be eligible if you have one year outside USA as a manager and you get transferred to USA also as a manager, definitely. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank Good you luck, sir. Much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. I'll see you guys in a couple of weeks.